Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, well, nice let me go ahead and jump into this. It's not much. I got a few little slides here for us and stuff, but uh, overall, this is my, uh, what are you struggling with? Uh, you know, that's, you know, if you have any questions, put them into chat. That's only if we get a whole bunch of people or I'm busy and you have an idea, put it in chat so Steve can field it for me. Uh, I might, we might be able to do question and answer with a smaller group we got here and stuff like that. But it comes down to what are you struggling with and and what would you like to improve and and how can I help? That's really all that I'm I'm really after right now. Uh, stop sharing, Greg. That's what I was. That's really what I'm. Uh, this one's about uh, as a forum to kind of go because I've got so much information to teach people. I'm kind of uh, want to reach out to the public in general and go. Uh, what because uh, I always put out what I think needs to needs to be out there or is good to put out there and stuff in seminars etc cetera, etc cetera, uh, uh live classes zoom classes and everything i thought well it'd be a good idea because what we're planning in process of kind of a a, a building a community that's what we're after is to uh to build a community to uh, you know a membership that comes in and we just start uh, connecting everybody in the United States if we can if they want to be a part of it and then offering a lot of help to everyone along the way that's the idea from anybody all over the world that's that's because that's trying to get that outreach to more people and i want to know more of how to be at serve with uh, to be of service. In other words, I put stuff out there because I think it's cool. <laughs> and you guys mostly think it is as well. And then I thought, okay, what, what do you guys, you know, how, what, what do you struggle with? And what could I put out there that would specifically help uh, your performing or learning needs in some way or the areas where you could use more clarification? So if anybody has Anything right now, just raise your hand. It's a small group and let's talk. Yes, Winifred. I have a problem sometimes with the jokes. Like I'm good with jokes, uh, the setup, and then the punchline is the middle part of it. Um, trying to figure out um, what I should say in that. The setup is good, the initial part, but then I get kind of lost in the middle. And um, working on the joke because I have like over 150 jokes and I'm good with jokes and I'm good with one-liners but then mm -hmm. sometimes I get stuck so I'm trying to figure out what to do or how can I make it better or improve it right so the first thing would be really helpful with that and and uh -huh. we do offer that in my uh, uh my level one classes but uh, we're putting together something for an online class, which is joke structure. Mm -hmm. uh, I, uh, so first of all, I coined the term joke structure as far as I know, uh, because setup and punch is not joke structure. Oh, okay. That's, that's I read that just, in the book, so I don't know. I, I know, and, and yeah. the, uh, yes, I know. <laughs> and it's all over the internet. Mm -hmm. They took a term that that I had very specifically defined, but that's not that's not the point here. So okay. yes, so so joke structure is so very important uh, because once you know how jokes work, <clears throat> then you can start to solve those situations. Also, I have a lot of guidelines for setups and punches. Uh, I, I I use setup and punch. Uh, when you get into storytelling and then you start applying joke theory and stuff to movies and sketches and sitcoms, setup and punch become a little bit more arcane, a little harder to use. Yet at the same time, uh, that's the first thing is to understand how jokes work. Uh, so that that there's three mechanisms that that connect uh, the setup and punch, let's say, and it's understanding the function of the setup to create misdirection and the function of the punch, which is to shatter that assumption. So the idea is behind that is, is for you to learn real joke structure. And you know, it's, it, it's difficult for me because I, like I said, uh, I, I was the one who coined yeah. 
So uh, to me, there's three mechanisms between the setup and the punch. You really are actually five mechanisms, but to understand those, and then that would clarify about what you should say and what you shouldn't say, and then what a joke is. So if for you, that would be as we, you know, the level, my level one classes have that, my books have that, et cetera, et cetera. So I can't, I'd have to teach a class right now to help you with that because it, it takes a little bit of study. Mm. Uh, it's like trying to learn something about music. You still have to go in and learn about treble and bass clef and, you know, notes and harmony and rhythm and timing and all that other stuff. So to answer that would be a, a seminar all into itself. Uh, yet that's what you, that to help you with that, I would point you at two things, which is my joke uh, structure and also the joke prospector that I have out there. Mm -hmm. Because the joke map teaches you how to write setups and uh, the joke mind teaches you how to write punches. Also that uh, in, in my level one classes here in Los Angeles out at Santa Monica Playhouse, we would address that and help you with it. And you would sit down and we'd write jokes. So uh, that, that for this particular simulcast, which is trying to figure out what people, how I can help people, that's the best I can lay out for you right now because this is not designed to actually spend a lot of time teaching. Mm -hmm. in this one is to find out what you need and so those give the answer but understand my definition of joke structure is very different than everybody else thinks it's set up and punch set up and punch for me is just how we express one-liners that's it that's all that it is so uh it, that's not well it's really the way we express it. it's like saying cartoon cartoon is one way to express humor Sketches is another way we express humor. One-liners, we express them through setup and punch. So uh, it, 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 joke structure goes a lot deeper, and we've got a lot of information that helps on that and all. So for, for this particular seminar, that's about the best I could do is to say, you know, go and learn that joke structure and learn some of my joke writing systems because they will lead you right directly down that path and solve that. Okay. So... Uh, Steve, anything come in? You're muted. Sorry, oh. I think Garrett has his hand up right now. Oh, okay. Uh, all right. Oh, no, actually, uh, Arthur had his hand up first, then we'll go to Garrett. Okay. So uh, I'm struggling with, with when I have a, a funny thought, I have a funny premise, I can't, but it Sorry for my bad English here. I'm I'm trying to. I will give you an example. I'm trying to work on a bit that I, that I say that I I don't think we we should fight for the right to abort because it is it's too easy to kill a baby. So there's another form of doing it. So this is just a fucked up thought. It's not funny. How I take this and make it funny with your five uh, five elements structure joke. Okay, so uh, uh, the. The uh, I'm not sure what the five structure things are, but uh, you know what? There are so many ways of writing jokes, uh, and there are so many different kinds of jokes. Some people think because I, the joke diagram does cover them all, but you have to learn how to kind of generalize out those particular uh, uh, mechanisms out to other kinds of jokes. So your idea here is to take your thought, okay? Now, have you studied, <clears throat> if you've studied my joke structure, and again, that's the place. For me, it all starts with joke structure, my joke structure, not other people's joke structure, because again, it's usually not jokes that are calling it joke structure, but it, for me, it's not joke structure. Uh, again, to me, jokes have two parts, and there are five mechanisms that connect those two parts. Okay, so for you to understand joke structure, to go, first of all, what's the thought? The thought is about that it's too easy for killing, you know, don't, don't, don't do it with abortion, that there's other ways to kill, kill babies. Is that what you were saying? <laughs> I think I'm saying that we should not bother if it, if, 
if you really want to get rid of your baby, there's easier. You don't need that, all, all that structure. Well, I to, think that's your thought right there. First of all, I think part of what you're dealing with here is a premise. Okay, and that's a really important thing for everybody to understand, the premise. Premise is, is for me, is so simple. It's a negative opinion about a subject. Okay, it's so simple. What are you talking about? And what position are you taking? So uh, yours is, is pretty clear, which is the subject is babies. And uh, the negative opinion, as it were, from some particular point of view, is that, that or, or don't do it, don't kill them through abortion. And then the jokes would be all the other ways you could kill them. <laughs> <laughs> you are a dark man. That's what I'm going <laughs> to right now. You are. Uh, and that wasn't a criticism, by the way. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> so. Uh, just to be clear to the audience that it looks like you're going to be pro-life, correct? K By kind of. Oh, oh, don't don't kill babies with abortions. That's yeah, like yeah, that, that, that's right. That's and then you come along and then you exaggerate, you take it further. Exactly. Yeah. So then here's here's how it lays out. Again, uh, these fundamentals are in, in my uh, level one classes, which is... Once you get a premise, okay, once you have a premise like that, then the jokes are simply examples of that premise. So for me, uh, maybe I should put out a little bit more information about how the the flow of, of jokes from the premise, that once you establish a premise, how the jokes are examples of it. So then for you, what we would do is then for you to state that premise in such a way that's kind of a joke, which which makes you really look like you're pro-life, yeah. but you're really much worse. Yes. You're kind of more of a serial killer. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and now, then you would follow that up with the examples of, so what are all the different ways that you uh, think we, that, that people could easier ways to, to kill babies? Yeah, so I, I'm trying to talk about the, the soft head, the baby's, have okay so you're gonna crush their soft head uh yeah. <laughs> i i i am uh in my actual uh current set i'm saying that if you pretend that you don't know about the soft head you can just let it slip i don't know and and nobody will yeah well <laughs> just becomes like you know uh, a, a melon that's got a soft spot so you could uh yeah yeah <laughs> yeah uh understood so I, I you know again every joke has to have a connector which is at the center of it's one thing with two interpretations that's the key to it all so uh for you to be able to take that thought that's what you do is you first turn it into a premise so you say it so we know where you're at and then give us examples of it and i would you know um, and this gives me the idea for the other thing, which is do you, if you don't know about the two list system, well, first of all, I would just use Google or chat, uh, uh, what is GPT, uh, and ask it and go in there and find out what are all these ways that, that, that babies die. Mm -hmm. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and then, you know. But find or just use your imagination, you know, you know, uh, dropping, you know, uh, whatever, you know, I don't want to get too ill here. So <laughs> you take me into this weird world. But what I would do is that, that but again, it's got to be in joke structure. In other words, if you now talk about it like a melon, now we've got, see, that's where you have to understand joke structure. Joke structure have two parts, Okay. And they have to be connected, every joke, and it, period. That's on the planet forever, okay? That's where the joke structure comes in. Set up and punch just tells you, oh, there's two parts. That's all it does. It's how you connect them and how they're compared. That's what makes a joke so good. So it's almost like having a simile or a metaphor for the different ways that you would do it. In other words, in American football, people spike the ball you know, if you're watching a football game, you might spike your baby. <laughs> uh, 
that there's other fun ways to go about doing that. So that would be the, you know, uh, and of course, I'm sure the advice I give everybody is when you're doing something this controversial, um, don't back up. <laughs> if people don't like it, just simply explain to them, if, if you're offended, stick around, it gets worse. Uh, because that's what happens and stuff. I think we lost Winifred over the uh, the dead baby stuff. So watch out for uh, that because that's going to happen. So, uh, and all. So uh, the idea there, again, I think what it comes down to is I need to offer more and more a clarity on joke structure because to me, that's where it all starts. You can't form your ideas until you, you know what a joke is. Uh, can't write a song until you know what a song is. You can go ahead and do it, but it really comes, everything really starts with, with understanding joke structure for everyone. So, you know, including taking your own thoughts and turning it into joke structure, which we spend a lot of time doing in, in my writing classes, because I got an ongoing writing class on Thursday night here and uh, uh, oh, it's on Zoom. Uh, that's part of that process is to, to, to help people take their thoughts and turn it into jokes. But you first have to know what a joke is and how they work. Then everything becomes much easier. So hope that was somewhat helpful. And all uh, Garrett has his hand up. We're going to go with him. Okay, Garrett, did you go to the bathroom? I did not. Okay. Or at least I hope I didn't. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, depends. I don't. Yeah. Exactly. Um, so, yeah. Uh, I, I have a. So I guess this is kind of a tangent to what you were just talking about. So, like, uh, I, I like write like rap songs every now and then. When I write a rap song, I know like when um oh Tom Schultz. It's like that he had a question. Uh, it's like if you. And go to the reactions thing. He's asking how to raise his hand. I'm saying you go to the reactions thing and then you yeah. click the hand. But um, so like when I write music or I write lyrics or whatever, I can understand. I can like appraise the uh the structure of the song. This rhymes with this. There's a certain syllable count, and so I. But like I don't have the ability yet to um do that with like uh comedy or with uh stand-up specifically i can't like uh i have like i don't know if these are even premises i have at this point like i can write i can like manufacture like jokes that kind of fit that second first story second story thing um just that you know i can do that but like i'm i'm at the point where i'm trying to first off figure out like okay i'm coming up with these ideas that make me laugh when I come up with them, and then like next day I look at them like, okay, what is this? Uh, actually, one second. Uh, well, Matthew, <laughs> thank you. I am back if I still have my turn. Oh, yeah, um, go ahead. Uh, sorry about that. Um, yeah, uh, so I was just saying that, uh, yeah, so I can do that with music. I can't do that with, uh, comedy. So I'm just trying to figure out. So, so I'm, I'm assuming you've studied music. Um, not even, but I know enough. It's, but it's intuitive. Like I can, like, I know when I, uh, this, I'm not like, uh, producing instrumental tracks. This is just like lyrics. I have a kind of like. It's not in, like, you're I, like doing, I know you're like doing more, more poetry. The uh... yes, yes, and it's obvious like what because like the mechanism almost is the rhyme, right? With with rap music at the very least, and I guess the single unit of comedy or at least stand up is like the the joke, uh, not necessarily a setup and punchline, but it can be if you're doing a bunch of one liners. Um, and I guess if I want to kind well, of coalesce it all kind of this, of always it always turns into two parts. In other words, mm -hmm. every joke is a comparison to something else. So, uh, it, again, it, it seems like all the answers, I keep coming back to the same thing, which is understanding how jokes work. The processing 
uh, of the human mind. Uh, I have a lot of that information. I teach some of it, but but more it's more uh, in my computer, and it'd probably be helpful to start to understand that. I'm sorry for the vague answers here and all. No, it's okay. I think I can um, maybe. But, but, but joke structure is so. Uh, there there are several things. One one is the joke structure. Just starting to get those mechanisms. Then for me, I have like six guidelines for writing. Uh, set, we'll call them set up and punches for now. First part and second part of a, of a joke. Um, to, to get that. But you see, here's uh, one of the rules. And it's one of the hardest ones. You know, rule, uh, not a rule, guideline is... Patton Oswalt said, in stand-up comedy, you strip out everything except what serves the joke. One of the, one of the more difficult things for me to get students to do because they think they need to say everything. And you don't. You need to only say, or the actions that you do as well that which will pop the joke. Even in storytelling, I spend much of my time with my advanced students editing out all of this unnecessary stuff. Because in the, in, in, in the beginning, they believe they need to say all of these things and you don't. Um, that the, uh, they're, there's a things I there's a thing I teach in in, in in the level one. It's called the crux, and I use it a lot in level two. And it's really helpful if you take every one of your jokes and what I call the crux, which is just shrink it down to what is it that the joke's about, right? Uh, it, 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 you know, it, it, in Arthur's case, it's it's it, 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 like uh, don't kill babies with abortions. Uh, here's another way. <laughs> I got. Do you follow? That's where I do. I take it to that. Okay, and it's very important. Then you build up just a little bit more to get the point across to people without adding anything else because. In, in my world, uh, I've documented at least as far, as far as, see, I can't tell anybody that anything is absolute in comedy because there's only one or two things that are absolute in comedy. Everything else is up in the air. I have found that there's, that the, if the human mind, in order to get a joke, goes through 26 different steps. Jokes are very simple, but their effect on the human mind is unbelievably profound and complex. Now, the human mind is an amazing phenomenon, let's say, uh, that it can do those 26 steps in nanoseconds. <laughs> I mean, it's almost can be almost instantaneous. So, uh, Yet many of the things that I'm telling people and I teach people are ba based upon putting things into a joke that slows down those 26 steps. Things that get in the way of people getting the information. Okay, because uh, just let me quickly go over this because this wasn't about teaching today, but we'll have to do a little bit so you understand. First of all, somebody has to receive the joke, okay? Now, uh, if you guys know anything about first and second story, which now I'd like to change the names of them, but I won't for right now. Um, the, the setup, the setup, you get the setup. In order to understand the setup, okay, like uh, uh, my grandfather died a peaceful death, he died in his sleep. We now start compiling a whole bunch of assumptions about what that means. What's the context? Is he in the, ho in the house dying? Is he in the hospital dying? Is he, you know, peacefully, he's sleeping, he fell asleep. Was he sleeping? What, you know, all that kind of stuff, a grandfather, all the meanings of those things. We compile what I call a first story. It's like this big movie in your head with all these details in it. And we compile those until we say, I know what the comedian means by that. 
Okay. That's just that. Now that's a lot of processing. I compile a bunch of them. I compare them. I uh, so on and so forth in a nanosecond and compared to the sentence that was said, compared along with the, the, the attitude, the, the, the body language and the, the expressions of the comedian and who the, com- the identity of the comedian is, et cetera. We process all that really quickly until we go, oh, I know what the, uh, the comedian means by that setup. That's a whole lot of processing to get to that. Once we get to that, then most people by default will go, I know what that means. Now I accept it as true. Once you accept it as true, not until then do you have expectation. See, other people are teaching expectation and surprise, and that's fine. That there's, there's a, but for me, there's a whole lot of processing that goes on that leads to expectation of that setup. Okay, now, any extraneous information in that setup that doesn't let that happen instantaneously by putting too much information into that setup where they could expect wrong and go another place. In other words, I'm trying to get them to go well, right to right to where I want them to go. Okay. So my grandfather died a peaceful death. He died in his sleep. I want to go hospital or at home. He fell asleep. Uh, he never woke up. It was kind of peaceful. It was nice. It was, you know, I want him to go into that world, into the way I say it. Everything. Oh, I'm going to lead them right to that misdirection point, that target assumption. Okay. But there's a lot of processing. Now, you add too much information to that setup, you can misdirect them wrong, or they get confused, or there's too much information they have to process before they get to that point, and you're already on to your punch. Oh, they haven't finished. Does, if everybody understands, this is a lot. So you've got to know. That's why you take everything out. Like Pat Oswalt says, strip out everything, 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 except what serves the joke. What gets them to the target assumption? Okay, let me finish this joke. My grandfather died a peaceful death. He died in his sleep. Of course, the other people on the bus were wide awake. Okay. Right. So, oh, well, I, he died at home. Now, it's, he died in bed. It's, it's really a where joke. Where did he die? And what was he doing? Right, sleeping. No, now the punchline is that he died peacefully in his sleep while driving a bus. <laughs> Maybe right. I didn't see the punch correct there, you know, the bus he was driving. Anyway, the idea behind this is now they get that punch. Okay. First, they have to build a second story so that that punch makes sense to them again. It's got to make sense to them before they can go on. Oh, that, that's a rational. You know, oh, the, the, the passengers on the bus were right wide awake. Oh, the passengers. Oh, the passengers. on the, Oh, I build a second story in my head until I go. Oh, I know what that means. Again, nanosecond. Then they go. Oh, there's there's a mistake. Something wrong. We call it in, in humor theory, they call it incongruity. Right? Oh, now I've got this incongruity. I then have to go, there's a mistake. I got to go back up to that setup and I stand and first story, and I've got to start looking around until I find where that mistake was made. Right? Et cetera. And I'm going, now if I got way too much information in that setup, it takes me, I'm now looking and looking instead of being able to quickly go, he died peacefully in a sleep. Oh, I thought in a bed. The quicker I can get them to the bed, and he's not in the bed, he's in the driver's seat of a bus, they now can do what's called resolve that incongruity. They compare them back and forth until they finally go, oh, I made a mistake with the setup. I thought I was right, but I made a mistake. And this shatters that assumption. Then it goes to the humor part of the brain, and then they decide whether or not they find humor in it. <laughs> and if they don't find humor in it, they don't laugh. If they do find humor in it, they laugh. Now, when you put too much information in the setup and the punch, anything that's not serving just the joke itself 
it slows all that processing down to a crawl, or they don't process it to the point of laughter before you're moving on to your next joke. So this is why when you look at a joke, I have people write it out. Now, I don't, you don't know, uh, know all about my work, but I don't let people memorize the I don't let them memorize their words of their joke in a certain way. I'm very specific about that. Uh, I'll talk about that another time. But so just in that alone, knowing that the, the, this, these two parts, this part's got to be established, expected. This part now creates a problem that's got to be resolved, and they've got to find the place where the mistaken mistake was made. And it's always the connector. It's the one thing in a joke that has two interpretations. Then they go, oh, I picked the wrong interpretation. Now, anything too much you put in a setup or too much information you put into a punch slows all that down and can either diminish the laugh or just kill it. Perfectly good idea for a joke, okay? But when you add all that extra information, so this is one of the hardest things for me to teach people, and maybe what, what that's the first thing I should offer maybe in a, in, in a uh, group, in a membership, when people want to come in. I think so far what I'm hearing is the same thing. Oh, I want to understand how the joke works so I can write a joke. And, it, and by the way, this doesn't matter if the joke is in a cartoon, uh, if the joke is in a sketch or a sitcom, a movie a one-liner, or a joke in a novel. It doesn't matter. Jokes process the same in the human mind. So the sooner that you understand how jokes work and you can clean out all of that debris of information, et cetera, it's, it's almost like the, 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 the shortest distance between two points is a straight line. Man, when I read people's jokes, they're going all over the place. There's no straight lines there. And eventually that connection happens, but by then they can't unpack it in order to find and, and to, to, to be able to, to, to resolve that incongruity to be able to laugh at it. For me, I want to write a joke so lean that they get an idea, instant expectation hit the punch, they resolve that incongruity, and it's almost an instant response from them. Ah, they just laugh. Okay, for every moment they've got to spend unpacking something or figuring something out, it's just all that energy by the, even if they eventually like the joke at the end, all that energy is used in understanding, figuring something out. So at the end, they might go, huh, still enjoyed it, but that's not what I want. You know, I want them to laugh so hard they bloody their forehead on the table, right? You know, you know, over and over again. That's what I want. So how do you clean out all of that debris? By the clarity of joke structure, what exactly are you communicating in that? The setup gets them to this. The punchline expresses this only. Punchlines are really, I always know when somebody doesn't know what they're doing, their, their setups are really, really long and their punches are really, really long. And the idea of the joke is lost in all that debris, all that excess information. Again, we come back to Pat Oswalt strips out everything. But first you have to know what the joke is. Oh, what's it? That's why the crux helps. What's the joke? Bring it down. Oh, it's this and this, this and this. Oh, the two things that we're really trying to get across here. Okay. Oh, grandfather died in, uh, in his bed, in a bed. Here, he's driving a bus. That's that's what I'm trying. He died while driving a bus. That's all I'm trying to get across. Now that I know that crux, I understand it. Now I can build out from there to use the minimum possible to make that joke work. In order to do that, you have to understand the mechanisms 
of target assumption and reinterpretation and the connector in between, the one thing that has two interpretations, because they just can't be two random thoughts. They've got to be connected, two ideas that are connected. That's what a joke is. joke is real simple. Boom. But it's got to have that connection. Can't it just have two random thoughts? It is two random thoughts, but there's got to be a connection. So that joke structure is imperative. Now that even dictates the performance, you know, that if, if I, you know, if I went, yeah, my grandfather died a peaceful death, he died in his sleep, you, died, you know, he died in his sleep. <laughs> and I'm adding that to it. You're all going to go, oh, he died while driving something. Screws up the joke. You follow? Oh, no, I, oh, he died a peaceful death. He died in his sleep. Right? That whole performance, everything is all about, oh, bed. Maybe in the hospital, but it was nice. Until the violentness of, of, <laughs> of wrecking a bus with people on it. Okay, so strip, 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 strip. Get to that crux. But you got to understand joke structure. That's, I mean, my joke structure. Again, everybody out there. I coined the term. Now other, other people are now giving it uh, other definitions that are, are just yeah, not that's on the planet forever. forever. Okay, that's where the joke structure the term now. Other, other... Who's talking? I think somebody's mic was coming back through a somebody's speaker was getting in through their mic. I think it might have been. Hey, Greg, I'm going to uh, take, uh, take advantage of this little break. Uh, we have about four questions left, and we have about a about 10, 10 minutes left in the time. Okay, so. good. What's the question? Uh, Want to go with uh, Matthew? Sure. Thanks. Yeah. Hi, Greg. Hey. Uh, what I had was I, I was reading uh, the, the um, number one, your, your first book here, and I was trying to figure out the um, when you got the setup, then you got the uh, story one, target assumption, the connector, and then when you get that half done, I, I would figure that's probably all the stuff that has to go into the setup. And then the second half, the reinterpretation and the second story is that yeah. that has to go in with the punchline. Yes. So uh, when I turn your your book here, it says to uh, once I got the setup, the story and the target assumption, it, it, it kicks me down to trying to go into the reinterpretation in the second story before the punchline. Right. No, I'd have to have a punchline first, right? Before I go into the reinterpretation. Well, the it, matters, it matters. It matters. See, some uh, comic minds, a lot of times, once you know what the assumption is and the, what the connector, even if you know what the assumption is, they'll, they'll jump. Boom. Right? You jump. That's fine. Okay? Until it's not. <laughs> right? If, if you're jumping and you're creating the idea for a joke really quickly, usually people jump from the the assumption to a reinterpretation and a second story all at once. But you got to understand joke structure. That's how I mean. Yes, you do have to understand joke structure. I don't know who said that, but yes, you have to understand joke structure. And my terminology as well, because setup and punch doesn't take you in between. Setup and punch is this, this, and this. It's, it's all that stuff in between that dictate how you write the setup and the punch. Oh. So, uh, so it, 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 what happens if a lot of people that jump from the first, uh, from the setup to the punch really, really quickly, mm -hmm. usually is the reinterpretation that contains the second story. Here's the problem, is the second story is so elaborate in your head in some ways They'll write a really long punchline because they're trying to describe everything in that second story in their head. Oh, okay. That's why I know somebody has, 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 it hasn't written a punch. They've written out the second story in their head. That's why it's important to know that. Now, somewhere in that second story, there's some section of it which is going to be the proper punchline. <laughs> Oh, okay. <laughs> right? Now, here's yeah. the secret. What's that piece of information? Because this is where my six guidelines uh, of writing punches comes in. The function of the punchline is very simple. It's to only to express the reinterpretation. What's that reinterpretation? Oh, 
He's driving a car. Maybe that one I did earlier is too long. What's the minimum I can let us know? You know, the passengers in the car, you know, uh, th there was a scream from the passengers in the car. You know, he read, you know, the pay whatever it is, that's what you're, that's what you're trying to, 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 that's it. All the rest of the stuff in your head, okay, is irrelevant. That's debris, rationalizations of the thoughts, ideas for tags. Oh, okay. So yeah, I have to have those two before the punch comes in. The punch. Okay. The punch is the shortest piece of information that expresses the reinterpretation. Okay. Every okay. get all the rest of the debris out. Okay, and then you keep working on that punch to see it can get shorter and shorter. And the last piece, of course, is the reveal, which is the exact piece of information that reveals the reinterpretation. It needs to be at the end of the punchline sentence. So you don't talk past your joke. You know where to pause, where to stop talking. Once you say, once you say the reveal of a joke, that fires the joke. Oh, the reveal tells us what the reinterpretation does and all that. Re that, that uh, the resolution trying to resolve that incongruity starts to happen in their head. They're going all over the place trying to figure that out. So once you hit that reveal that now expresses the reinterpretation, you need to train yourself if you're to stop talking and listen to the audience. Oh, that's the point. I'm now listening to the audience. How long are they laughing? When am I going to uh, come in and interrupt with the next thing I'm going to say? Because if you then start to talk, the audience will stop laughing to hear what you have to say. But you don't want them to stop laughing. I've seen people all the time diminish and kill laughs because they don't shut up. <laughs> yeah. I, it's really that simple. I mean, it's like, you know, uh, you know, you hit that, you hit the end, you hit the end of that punchline, boom, it's that piece of information, the joke starts to fire off and run its course. And again, it happens in nanoseconds. But you need to pause because they may take one, two, by three, they're starting to laugh, then you let them laugh and you let them laugh for as long as they want. And when it peaks and starts to drop, you come back in. You don't let it hit the bottom. You let it peak, start to drop, you come back in interrupt them just a little bit so uh oh okay yeah i definitely yeah. want to come so down for take you, it it's awesome. about probably from that re and once you get a reinterpretation you gotta shorten all that down and go what's the minimum amount of information to make that that punchline work damn i spend a lot of time with my students i say when they get a punch i'll go shorter and they'll they'll make it shorter okay now shorter and they'll make it shorter and shorter well, I only got one word. Right. That's all you need. <laughs> okay. So the reinterpretation word. will make the punch. Okay. Yeah. And how short story can too. you get it? Okay. And, and, you know, right. So that it fires off that joke really quickly. It's a punch. There's a reason for the punch. It comes out of nowhere and it's fast and sharp. Okay. Great. A long yeah, that's punch what, line okay. kills the power of a joke that should jolt and surprise. In other words, they're thinking they're thinking this, and you go wrong, right? Should I mean it should come out of the blue? Boom, pop. That's why it's called a punch. Yeah. And then you let them do their processing. So, so we find out if they think it's funny, but it, the idea comes out. You know, boom, little, you know. Again, all that processing really it's nanoseconds. You know, it's one second you know, less sometimes. The idea is get all the debris out so that that processing can happen with a minimum of information so it's an instant response. You know, I don't want them to ever think or figure out anything. I want them to instantly respond. That's it. Anything else, Steve? Thank you. Uh, we well, have John with the question. Jan, John. what's up, buddy? Your suggestions for reading our audiences. Ah, well, boy, that's a nice one. Um, first of all, the first thing that has to be done when you're reading an audience, there's, a, there's several areas for this, but the first thing has to be, you need to be present. It's all about where you're putting your attention. Okay. If your attention is, oh, I got it. What's the next thing I'm going to say? 
you're just going to say it because I got to get to the next thing I'm going to say. I'm going to get the next thing I'm going to say. Next thing I'm going to say. I got to get the next thing I'm going to say. There's no attention for the audience. Okay, we come back to my basically hierarchy of, of performing techniques, which is the most important thing about stand-up comedy is the relationship with the audience. Right? Uh, for me, that relationship is the show or the show is the relationship, whatever you want to say. It's not the material. A lot of people think, oh, it's the material. No, it's not. See, that's what makes stand-up comedy such a wild, weird beast that, that the actual show itself includes the audience. Even into the minimum part of taking a pause while they're laughing, you've got to know that. And when do you come back in? Oh, that's the minimum. There's all kinds of other things about rhythms and timings and all those other things that you're doing. When do you interrupt? When you come back in, how long do you give them? Uh, uh, the difference between one-liner tag uh, timing and tag timing, where you you don't let them, you don't let it fall back down. You just keep pushing it up. There's all these things that are going on, and the rhythm that you develop with an audience. So you have to have your attention on the audience. You got to be listening and feeling, and if you can, seeing. A lot of times you can't. But you got to be involved with that rhythm. Uh, so that's the first thing. The audience's information has got to come into you. Now, sometimes it doesn't feel good. Like a, one time, one of my students was bombing for a couple of minutes in class. I'm the timeout stop. Okay, have you noticed nobody's laughing? And he said, "Yes, but I didn't want it to affect me." Mm -hmm. <laughs> Right. That's what it looks like. It looks like you're doing your show exactly the same way you decided at home, uh, whether the audience laughs or not. So they're not affected. The audience isn't even in the equation for that person. That happens a lot. There's a lot of reasons for it. The, the, uh, to me, the audience is half of the equation. If they're not laughing, then you would just see if you could find their funny bone. If they are laughing, then you develop a rhythm with them. If the audience is split, you try to unify them. Okay, if there's a, a group or somebody acting out, hecklers or whatever you want to call then you deal with that and see if you can bring them into the fold to join everybody or at least to shut up, <laughs> right? So you can develop a rhythm with the audience. There's all the, But the audience's information is critical to a show. That is my definition of a relationship. You care enough to let their information have an impact on you emotionally, physically, and your behavior. That's the relationship. Their information is, is affecting you every moment of the show. If you watch people that are really good, yeah, they do essentially the same material, but they never do what I call the same interpretation of that show because they'll adjust all these nano adjustments that happen during the course. They slow down, they speed up, they'll say it faster, they'll say it with different emotions. You know, there's, there's all these little things, adjustments you do in a show that tailor it for the audience that's in front of you. Sometimes it's big things. Sometimes it's a little bitty small ones. But I can always tell when someone, I don't know if you guys can tell it or not, what we call canning the show, put the show, it's canned right? The show's can. That means they've decided at home or from previous performances how that show's going to go. Okay. Which means their attention's not on the audience and it's not a relationship. What they're doing is carrying out their plan despite what's, what's going on in the audience. Yeah. Uh, I've even seen it to be so bad that the audience is laughing and the comedian's like, you ever see them do that? Going, tch, 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 tch. I, they're almost saying to the audience, would you stop screwing up my show with all that applause and laughter? Because they've decided from previous performances how it should go, or they decided at home in their rehearsal how it's going to go. Now, for me, that's much like a surfer standing on the beach deciding how he or she is going to ride every single wave in the future. Doesn't matter if it's a hundred foot wave or it's just a little curl. Oh, I'm going to ride them all exactly the same way. I'm deciding ahead of time. 
But that's what comedians do. They lock down, they set their show. Does that make sense? They set the show and they do it the same way every time. Therefore, you know, so long ways to go here for this, John. First, you have to put your attention on the audience. Second is you've got to let that come in and take it and let it have an impact on you emotionally, physically, script-wise, all that other stuff. And again, it's not always big stuff. It's all this little minor stuff. It's a rhythm that changes. Uh, the intensity changes. Maybe you do it a little slower. If it's a hot firing class, uh, 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 people that are on, you pick it up and you pick up your jokes and you go faster with it. And you go through your material faster because they're on top of it, man. They're picking it up. They'll get bored if you don't. Other audiences are slower and it takes them longer to process that, the, the, you know, to go through that incongruent. Slow it down. Give them a little bit more intensity. Uh, David Tell, I've heard a quote of his one time, is after you do a show, the interpretation of that show, the way you did that show is exposable, disposable. You just throw that away. The way you did the show, not the show. It's the way you did the show. Then you get up in front of the next audience and figure out how you're going to do your show with them. See, it's language. It's with them. It's not at them. It's not to them. It's with them. Now, we get to the point, that part, <laughs> I got attention on the audience. Ways of doing that, those a couple of things. Now, now we go into my whole area of how do you get your attention on the audience? Now we're entering into my whole area of what I call my rehearsal process. And that is its own whole area of mental processing. Uh, if you, I'll give you a shortcut version of this. And again, I think it's one of the most important things I can offer people. We, I always go back to how the mind is processing stuff. How does the mind deal with it? And I read neuroscience. I read psychology. I mean, it's stuff I've read and I've been into for years. So... If you rehearse by saying the words out loud over and over and over again till you get the words right, it I don't know where it gets coded, but it gets coded on the brain somewhere. And the only way to retrieve it is to look down and talk to yourself, talk the joke to yourself, and then say it to the audience. And then it's like, oh, I've got to, what's the next thing I'm going to say? You go into that, and it's a soundproof room. Once you go into that, that that internal, it takes all your concentration to talk to your talk to yourself, tell yourself what's the next thing you're going to say. There is no attention to the audience, so you're going, oh, uh, this is what I'm supposed to say, and then you say it. Oh, this is what I'm so, and it's linear. You have to say it exactly like you practiced it, uh, and you'll correct yourself if you don't. You'll stop. Oh, I got to stop, and I got to do it just exactly like I said it before. And it's linear. You have to do it from A to Z. You can't, you can't, you can't break that pattern. It's got to go all the way through, right? And any interruption to any of that, and you'll probably go blank uh, and get lost. Uh, I know because I used to do work that way and stuff down and you boom, all of a sudden now you can't think. Because our mind works normally in picture sounds and feelings. Oh, gosh, we go into a lot of brain theory here, mind theory. The only way to get information into the human mind is through our senses. That's it. Five senses. That's it. We don't get information into our mind any other way. Now, we code it in pic uh, short, shortcut picture sounds and feelings. And then we retrieve it in picture sounds and feelings. And then that picture sounds the feelings when we see it in normal life turns into body language, vocal tone, and words. So we describe that and explain the picture or the story or the opinion or whatever else that we do. Okay. That's normal human behavior. And it's the way you've been telling stories your entire life when you're in a, a casual situation. Then. I don't know why. Probably because actors were told, oh, you got to memorize your lines. So people go over the lines, go over the lines. And now, instead of picture sounds of feelings, 
that material gets coded into the part of the brain where the only way to get it out is through the eyes go move down to the left. You talk to yourself, say it to the audience, talk to yourself, say it to the audience. Now that you know that, go out and watch people. You can always tell the word memorizers because they're looking down all the time or they're touching their nose or their ears and they've kind of glazed over and they're talking to themselves. They're not listening to the audience. There's no, inf no information can go in. Where with pictures and you're talking, when, 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 when you're telling the story um, to your friends, uh, whatever that means for you, some people it's at work, some people it's, you know, with their gang of friends, maybe it's with your family, maybe it's with all of them, whatever, that place where you can really get the audience laughing, having a good time. Maybe it's after some liquid courage. I don't know. Everybody's different, right? Now, when you're telling that story and you're making everybody laugh in the normal world and you've been doing it your whole life, let's look at that. Did you memorize the exact, exact words? Probably not, because it's a story in your head and you're remembering pictures, sounds, and feelings, and now you're telling the story, okay? Did you lock it down so it has to go a certain way? So every movement is exact and word and intonation? No, you didn't do that. You're probably not criticizing yourself. You're having fun and playing around your friends. Do you follow? If everybody's enjoying it because it's in pictures, sounds, and feelings, you add some more jokes to it and adjust the story to the people that are laughing. You wait for laughs and you add more laughs. Or if it's bombing and nobody cares, you can shut it down really quickly and get out of it. That's picture, sounds, and feelings. In internal dialogue, you've got to go from A to Z without any interruption, or you'll go blank. Or you'll have to rewind it to someplace. So is that the store? Watch people do that all the time. So if, if people have put it in internal dialogue in my advanced class, it's so easy for me to know. Because all I have to do is go, what did you have for lunch yesterday? Why is that so easy? Because now they have to go back in their real memory, pull out those pictures and the sounds and the feelings and sit there and live inside that little moment when in their head while they were having lunch and go, oh, I had some pasta and a clear bowl with this sauce and a seven up and, a, you know, a picture set and they'll start touching it because pictures cause you to behave. That's the way you've been funny your whole life. So I don't know if you've memorized words or not, but my rehearsal process, the idea is to take all of your jokes. Don't get me wrong. All of my advanced people have script because part of the script is get out all of the debris, write it down, go, that's it. But I don't want you to memorize the words of that over and over and over again. Those words, those words, 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 until it turns into internal dialogue because you're never going to have attention for the audience. I'm not saying you don't even want to. I'm going to say you can't. You can either go there and deal with that and say it, or put your attention on the audience and be blank. Because I get students all the time and they want to go back. Don't look at them, look at us. And if I don't let their eyes go down so they can talk to themselves, they'll, 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 there's an alternative. Looking off to the side, that's the other way of doing it. <laughs> they have all these other things, or they just close their eyes and do it, or you know, they all kind of, you know. There's all these things that they're, but they want to go back in because their information's in the wrong spot in their brain. It's not picture sounds of feelings. It's internal dialogue. It's self-talk. It's the same. It, you, to get the information, you got to go in self-talk. So that's the first thing you have to understand. My rehearsal process allows you to get your material in your head like a, like a story that you've always been telling and tell the story of those. Even if it's a one-liner, it's this little bitty story. It's a first story and a second story. And we got this whole little thing going on here. It's still a story. You're always telling a story, which is one of the most powerful ways we communicate with other people. Uh, There's a great uh, TED talk on this about storytelling. This woman was on there and she uh, talked about, she said, oh, here's an MRI when you give people information and a few places were lit up, right? Now here's a human brain when they're listening to a story. And, and, and it was like a Christmas tree. The whole brain was all lit up because there's all these synaptic connections that are all going all crazy and stuff like that That because of a story. Oh, you give them a bunch of sentences about information. Not much. You give them a story. The whole mind starts to engage. 
So for me, uh, to me, in the end, it's you know, I know I don't even care if it's a one-liner as long as you're still telling a story. But it's got to be in your mind as a story to be able to express it as a story. It's got to be in pictures, sounds, and feelings. It's got to be in sensory terms, not in language, in internal dialogue. Okay. Language and that, that restricts everything. All of a sudden, I am not going to get. There's even so much more to this theory, but I teach this in my level one. Explain to people: Look, here's how you have to rehearse. You have to rehearse it like it's a real scene, and you're there. Everything. I mean, every everything you say, everything, everything. So you're constantly just telling story based upon picture, sounds, and feelings. You're expressing it in body language, vocal tone, and words. Words, words help you describe it, not help you remember it, help you describe it, okay? If the words are what you think you need to remember, you've missed the boat. You've missed the whole point because the whole point is a relationship. You're catering, you're tailoring the show to these people in all these minor ways and sometimes major ways. Uh, so my wife, Gayla Johnson, she was, she does this bit about to see, uh, Jehovah's witnesses bothering her. Uh, and then she did another piece about, uh, she uses these bubba teeth, uh, as, uh, uh, she, she talks about it being, uh, how, how to, how, you know, it's rape prevention. Some guy's bothering you at a club or in, where are these big, ugly bubba teeth? And these guys, uh, uh, even if they're after, you know, whatever, you know, they're, you know, it's birth control, it's rape prevention. These, like she said, after she's a very good looking lady, she puts those on and you know, a big, ugly, you know, bubba teeth. And she goes, I put these on and I can't even give away a blowjob. No, <laughs> you know, she, you know, uh, and then she acts it out, acts out this whole thing. Um, then I she I was there at her show. I go to a lot of her shows with her and stuff, especially when she travels on the road. And uh, after she did that, some guy in the audience said, hey, you should actually use that against the Jehovah's Witnesses. Gayla knows that it's about the relationship. She went, that's a great idea. So she went back and did the whole Jehovah's Witness piece again with the Bubba Teeth. The audience was crying by the end of the piece because they knew she was making it up just for them. Now, that's an extreme example, but Gayla knows it's about the relationship. It's not about the material. It's about that this guy said it, and she went back and did it. And I'm standing next to day. She was featuring. And she, I was standing next to the headliner, and he's watching this, and he's going, how the hell am I going to follow that? <laughs> I mean, the audience was screaming, and then at the end of it, she took out the bubba he thank you, I'm Gayla Johnson, goes off stage. This guy's going, holy, you know, he goes, how the hell am I going to follow that? I said, go out and say that. <laughs> just walk out and go, how the hell am I going to follow that? <laughs> Which is what he did. And the audience laughed and got on his side, and he, and he was a really good headliner. I mean, he turned it right around, but he was afraid. Yeah, go out and call it. God, she just did a great show. What the hell, man? And, but the point was, he now opens his show differently than he thought, because it's a relationship. She did her show as a relationship. You know, the audience is just loving every moment of this. So how do you read the audience? First of all, there's there's a lot of answers to that, and I don't have the time because we're probably way over time. Yeah, we're about 15 minutes over. There, there are a whole bunch of different techniques for it. But the first one is... You have to have attention for the audience. And I say you have attention for the audience 100% time of the show. There you go. You could do that with picture sounds and feelings because we're used to telling stories while looking at people and dealing with the changing environment. Well, you've been telling stories your whole life. What changes is when you memorize the words, say the words, say the words, say the words, because it's all about what I'm supposed to say next. It gets coded in the internal, in the part of the brain where you, the only way to get it back out is internal dialogue. Talking to yourself just plugs up the whole normal, natural system of being funny. 
because it's messy and it messes your, it changes your personality, changes the sense of humor, changes your whole mode of communication, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and that's why you see a lot of comics uh, overbehaving. Oh, you did uh, indi what they call indicating and acting because they know they're supposed to have those emotions, but it's not generated normally in, parts, in storytelling. So they put it on top of everything that they do. So you end up with these people that are acting rather goofy. So that's because they're adding those things on top. They've got memorized words. Now they're adding those other things on top because they know they're supposed to have it. But that's not the way they've been funny their whole life. The rest of your life, you've been funny by telling stories with picked from, from remembering real events. Question is, how do we get your material into your mind as picture sounds and feelings, as events, as a moment in time, as an experience, as a story, as a happening, as an event. I don't use whatever language you want to use. But once it's that, then you can, doesn't matter the material that you wrote and other people put tags into it and other people wrote jokes for you. You do my rehearsal process. It'll be in your mind that way. And then it's easy to tell story. Then stand-up comedy changes because when people actually do what I tell them, they go, oh, this is so much easier than what I was doing. I was trying to remember every little thing I'm supposed to say and every little thing I'm supposed to do. And now I'm just telling a story, having fun with the audience. Yeah. Because that's the way you've been funny your whole life. I'm just trying to keep that. I'm not, you know, I, I, I invented a way to teach you how to do a, a rehearsal process. But you know, the way you've been funny your whole life is already there. It's already there. You just got to stop interrupting it with bad technique, bad rehearsal, rehearsal that gets in the way of that. So there's your answer, John. It's all about, so those are, and, and again, it's the big chunks, as I've said with other people, mostly what, what people really need to do is really learn joke structure. And I think that's, I've got to put more details into that uh, as I develop this, uh, uh, this uh, membership to put it in so people can come in and really understand more about joke structure. And I've been working on that. And the other thing is for them to really understand the rehearsal process and the reasons why, because, you know, when, when you get the simplicity of jokes and now you're remembering your material naturally as picture sounds and expressing them naturally, uh, you're, you're, the re the proper resources that you've had, the way you've been doing it your whole life really raises, then your the chances, I can't guarantee something's going to be funny, but your chances of being funny really go up. Because <laughs> what you're performing are jokes. I don't tell my advanced people or any of my students, I, I can't guarantee an audience all over your life one of your jokes. That's, I'm not in the future. I don't, you know, I don't even tell people if something, I think something's funny. Because I'm wrong all the time. It's my sense of humor, not yours. Trust your own sense of humor. Go out there and find out. I can't. I can't guarantee whether the audience will laugh. I can guarantee whether or not it's a joke. Because a joke has a definition. I've defined it. I've given it. A, it has a structure, and I can teach people these things to use these things, so that when you go on stage, what you're talking about are in joke structure, and. You've not memorized the words per se. You're still going to memorize words or part of it, but it's not that internal dialogue. It's not that repeat the words over and over and over again until I know exactly what to say. That's what gets in the way. Now, if I can get all that material that are jokes into your head as picture sounds and feelings, and you're always telling stories and remembering naturally and communicating naturally, all the skills you've been honing your whole life are now being used. Being funny is a blast because I'm telling you, when you get up and you start getting get an audience on a roll and you just kill it, you just crush it. You just can't have more fun with your clothes on or without drugs. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to wind this up, give it back over to Steve. If, if anything else is going on, I thank you all for coming in today. I really enjoyed answering your questions and stuff. And we will uh, pick this up again next month, probably at least one a month. I'll be doing one of these. All right. I will see you then. Thank you all so very much for showing up. And I hope some of this was helpful. Thank, thank you, you very much.
Appreciate it. Uh,